Time to begin our services. Good to see everyone that's here tonight feeling well enough to be out. We have several of our families that we want to make mention of in our prayers. Uh, a lot of them coming back from camp and not feeling well and having COVID, so let's remember them in our prayers. And when I, give me just a second, I just remember the family I need to mention. Uh, so we've got several we want to mention in our prayers as we go into our services tonight. Brother Swindle's not with, Eli's not with us tonight. He's not feeling well, so Jennifer stayed home with him. Uh, so let's remember Eli in our prayers and also Hopefully that everything will be well with Jennifer. Let's remember the uh, Sibley family. None of them are going to be here tonight. We know in the Kia, both uh, Jaden have COVID, so let's remember that in our prayers. Uh, also, Lori is not with us tonight again, and she's in Lane's home with her, so let's remember Lori in our prayers. I know that she struggled with her health. The Bradleys, the McSpaddens, and also the Williams are not with us, so that's several families that we have that we know that are out uh, due to sickness or, or trying to stay away from the group due to, uh, you know, to... Previous sickness, like Sister Shalanda had the uh, COVID, so let's remember them in our prayers. Also, some that we need to remember that are not with us tonight, Sister Jean McDonald's not with us. She's home taking care of Timmy, so let's remember her and Timmy in our prayers. Also, Brother Jeremy Hayes is not with us tonight. He's staying with his dad, so that's the reason for his absence. So let's remember uh, Brother Hayes and his uh, situation with his father as well. Uh, a couple of special announcements. Uh, we're... The elders have decided that we may try to do a meeting August the 12th through the 14th, which would be a weekend meeting at North Bid this time because of the difficulty we're having with being able to get a, a, a time that everybody can meet. So if you would think about the, uh, the 12th through the 14th on August 12th through the 14th and see if that's an issue to anyone. If not, then that may be an excellent time to have it. So again, that would be August the 12th through the 14th. Also, uh, as the elders work to set up uh, meetings in advance. They would also like for us to ponder the last full week of January as one meeting period and also uh, the last full week of July and see if those dates are good for everyone uh, so that we could, you know, maybe have that to where that would be the continual period they would have meetings so that everyone would know to schedule away from those weeks because that's weeks that we would be using to do our gospel meetings. So again, that would be the last full week of January for one and then the last full week of July. So if you would, please consider those dates, and if you have an issue with any of those, please let Wes or Donald or someone know, and we'll get that message to them. So thank you for that consideration. Also, today is the third Sunday, and as Lord willing, uh, as we're, Lord willing, we will meet tonight after our study, after our Bible study for a short period of time to uh, remember a lot of folks that we know that need our prayers right now. They're not feeling well. For those that you can do it, we will continue to do that after our services, maybe 15 minutes after services tonight. In the order of our services tonight, Brother Donald Drake will be our song leader. After, uh, at the appropriate time, we'll have Brother Jolly, if he would, to direct our minds in prayer. And then uh, Brother Tate Sib Sib Swindle, I'm sorry, will have our Bible reading. And if you would get your Bible and turn to Proverbs chapter 12, Proverbs chapter 12 will be our Bible reading. And we'll have to read verses 1 through 14. So I want to remember also the Hope family. I noticed Brother Justin come in, and I'm sure the, this morning they were staying outside, and they too are trying to make sure that they're staying away from everyone uh, due to the sickness. So let's remember the Hope family as well in our prayers. Is there an announcement that a man knows of that we need to make at this time before we begin our services? If not, then we'll turn it over to Brother Tate to do our Bible reading. Proverbs 12, 1 through 14. Whoever loves instructions loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked intentions he will condemn. A man is not established by wickedness, but the root of righteousness cannot be moved. An excellent, an excellent wife is a, the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but he can't but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. The word of the wicked are lie, lie and wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, and the house, but the house of righteous will stand. A man will be condemned, commended according to his wisdom. But he who is of perverse heart will be despised. Better is the one who is slighted, slighted but has a servant than he who honors himself but lacks bread. And a righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. He who tills the land, his land will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows frivolity 
is devoid and understanding. The wicked covet the catch of the evil men, but the root of righteous yields fruit. The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through, a tr through trouble. A man will be satisfied with good by, his, by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered to him. Proverbs 12, 1 through 14. Of number six hundred <clears throat> of number six hundred seventy three. <clears throat> Here we are, but straying pilgrims here. Our path is often dim, but to cheer us on our journey, still we sing this wayside hymn. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes here our feet are often weary on the hills that throng our way here the tempest darkly gathered but our hearts within us say yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise soon will be our home forever and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes here our souls are often fearful of the pilgrim's lurking foe, but the Lord is our defender, and he tells us we may know yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise. Soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. <clears throat> the next song will be number 711. And after this song, we'll have the first prayer. 711, Hilltops of Glory. <clears throat> Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Way down in Egypt, mid burning sand. Moses had started for Canaan's land. Never turn backward, always a sin. Unto the journey's end, hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand, hilltops of glory land. Footsteps of Jesus before us lead. We tread life's journey, his warnings heed. Evil allurements cannot prevail. I'm on the upward trail. 
hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. At this time, let's now go to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, holy and righteous, Father who art in heaven, how wonderful and glorious is thy holy name. Father, we are thankful to you that you have given us the good health and the ability to be here this day to remember thy holy son Jesus this morning and once again this evening as we study another portion of, our, uh, of your word uh, this evening. We're always thankful for the, the wonderful and many blessings that you give us in this life. We are also mindful, Father, of those of our number this evening who are suffering illness and will not be able to be with us. We ask that you comfort them in their sickness and uh, as only you can. We pray, Father, for the souls throughout the world they have yet to come to know you and to obey you. We pray that there will be things said and done to bring as many into the fold of Christ as possible. We certainly do not neglect our share of the responsibility for this either. We are certainly responsible for carrying thy word forth we ask you to give us strength and courage and the wherewithal to be able to share these, these words of salvation, this good news of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. We ask you to go with us now in the remainder of this service and beyond that, uh, safe travel to our homes that we might uh, uh, come back here again at the next appointed time. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the song for the lesson will be number 495. <clears throat> oh, for a faith. <clears throat> oh, for a faith that will not shrink. <clears throat> Seems like a long time ago now we began a uh, series of lessons from the book of Job. And um, we began by looking at uh, Job as the sufferer in the dark, as uh, one of the best men that ever lived who suffered in ways that are just horrible to contemplate and, uh, and, and really never did know why. And we, we looked at his reactions, some of them were marvelous and others were 
uh, I think uh, later regrettable. But overall, one thing the Bible makes clear is Job's abiding faith, his patience. Ultimately, Job never did curse God and die. He ultimately did remain faithful to God, and uh, he was uh, no doubt rewarded. Uh, we also looked at the friends, these uh, self-deceived saints who thought they were doing God's work when they were doing no such thing. And uh, a great lesson that they teach us is that uh, just because we're confident doesn't mean we're right. Uh, bluster and bravado and uh, uh, the wisdom of the ancients is no guarantee that we're right. Uh, so it's a cautionary tale. We can do a lot of damage with all the best intentions. Uh, and so that was a lesson from that. We also looked at Satan in the book of Job and how the devil works on men. And I think that the book of Job really, instead of being some unusual tale of the devil getting involved just one time and the temptation of a man really represents the way it works all the time. I think the devil is, is active. He and his minions uh, are active in this world. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against uh, the spiritual wickedness in high places. So the book of Job is a really uh, great model to remind us of where the real fight is. But we uh, just introduced, and we're going to finish tonight, what I think is the heart of the book. When you get right down to the book of Job, you know, when people think about that book, they think about Job suffering, or they think about the friends, or they think about, but I tell you, the, the message of Job uh, is the greatness of God. Uh, and, and if we don't see that, we really miss the point, don't we? Uh, so we want tonight to, to continue our study of Jehovah as the one who is beyond judgment. If there's a defining characteristic of God, there are several. One of them has to be that God is beyond judgment. Men have stubbornly not learned that lesson, and they continually put God on trial. I may have already mentioned this to you, but books like this written by Christopher Hitchens a few years ago, an international bestseller, by the way, because there is always a market for garbage. And so Christopher Hitchens, the celebrity atheist, um, tells us that, uh, remember the old children's song, God is great, God is good, or the, I guess the children's prayer. Well, God is not good. And uh, he goes on in this book uh, with some shrillness telling us about uh, how the Bible is just a terrible book. Is it too modern to notice that there is nothing about rape or nothing about the protection of children uh, from cruelty, nothing about genocide? Or is it exactingly in context to notice that some of these very offenses are about to be positively recommended? I don't remember the Bible recommending these things. But anyway, Hitchens is just sure the Bible is just filled with all kind of wickedness. He says, nothing proves the man-made character of religion as obviously as the sick mind that designed hell, unless it is the sorely limited mind that has failed to describe heaven, except as a place of either worldly comfort, eternal tedium, or, as Tertullian thought, continual relish in the torture of others. So the Bible just needs to a rewrite, and uh, Hitchens would be a great man to do that because, after all, he's smarter than God. We live in a world full of folks like that. Um, and we hear that kind of, of just brash, blasphemous, uh, fearless when they ought to be afraid attitude. What, what's really even worse in some ways is when religious people pick up on that same kind of, of brashness. And uh, I may mention to you about Mr. Kushner's book. This was a book that uh, sold a lot of copies a number of years ago. It was called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And you still see books uh, like this floating around. Uh, but uh, Kushner's attitude about explaining evil in the world is horrible. Uh, he was a Jewish rabbi, you know, and would have considered himself a very reverent man. But you can't be reverent and write such things. Are you capable, he asked us, of, of forgiving and loving God, even when you have found out that he is not perfect? Even when he has let you down and disappointed you by permitting bad luck and sickness and cruelty in his world and permitting some of those things to happen to you, can you learn to love and forgive him despite his limitations as Job does? And I think, is there another book named Job that he's talking about? I mean, surely. 
But that's his solution. Yeah, bad things happen in the world, and actually God is at fault. We just have to forgive him. Okay. Just like Job did. You know when Job forgave God? Remember that? I don't remember that. I remember Job wanted his day in court, if you'll pardon the expression. I do remember that. He talks about that several times, and we just mentioned a couple. But in chapter 23, for example, in verse 3, Job said, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. He's talking about God. I would lay my case before him. I would fill my mouth with arguments. I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, he would pay attention to me. There is an upright man, could, there an upright man could argue with him and I would be acquitted forever by my judge. Several times he mentions such things. The last speech of Job, nearly the last thing he says in chapter 31, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps like a prince. I would approach him. Job uh, had been provoked to the point where he just said, yeah, I just wish God would not give me a chance. I'd just tell him about my innocence. Job had his chance to talk to God, as it turns out. The Lord appears in a whirlwind, you remember? But it does not go as Job thought. If you'll turn with me over to the 38th chapter in verse 1 beginning, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And he said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and thou shalt answer me. I've thought a lot of times, you know, when you read the Lord's speech, and this is the key point of the book, not all the suffering of Job, not the words of the friends, that takes up the most of the book. But I think it's the words of God that are the heart of this book. When you listen to what God says to Job, Job says, explain to me why I'm suffering. What he gets in return is not what he expected. And I'll tell you, this tone that he sets here in his very first words, God's words to Job, it reminds every father in this room of the talks you have to have with your son or your daughter sometime. <laughs> when you uh, pull them aside and you have to get them straightened out on something. And that's what the Lord does to Job. It's not a malicious thing, but it certainly is a blunt, plain speech. It is not an apology. It's not even an explanation. It's God the Creator talking to His beloved creature and reminding him of the difference in the two. I don't know where these people get these ideas. You know, Mr. Archer wrote a survey of the Old Testament, an introduction. And I guess books like this, their great value is they're written to people who don't know much about the Bible and trying to explain to them about what the Old Testament's about, what the books are about. This is what he wrote about Job. <clears throat> the theme of Job. This book deals with the theoretical problem of pain in the life of the godly. And I thought, what an interesting way to talk about Job's problems, the theoretical pain. It undertakes to answer the question, why do the righteous suffer? I hope the folks in this audience know how wrong that is. If Job is written to answer the question, why do the righteous suffer, it fails to answer its point. It fails to ever reach its purpose. Because nothing in the book, as far as I know, explains why the righteous suffer. The very fact is, the Job is, is a sufferer. It's very different than saying God ever explains why. God does not offer to Job any clarification, any justification, any explanation for why he's suffering. If he does, I missed it. When God finally speaks at the end of the book of Job, it is not to explain to Job. Now let me tell you exactly what happened here. Let me show you why I let you suffer this way and how this works out in your life. None of that. What does God do when he speaks? 
He explains his greatness. And that answers Job's question. Not as he expected it to, but that answers our question as a sufferer. The greatness of God, the majesty of God, is what this book really is about. When you talk about the defining characteristics or attributes of God, we always talk about God's omniscience, his omnipotence, uh, and uh, his omnipresence. His omnipresent, his all-present nature. Proverbs 15 and verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. That can't be said of a creature. It can only be said of God. His omniscience. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, no creature can hide from God. Everything is uncovered and exposed for him to see. We must answer to him. His all-powerful nature, his omnipotence. Revelation 1 and verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. Only God is the Almighty. And I think when you read the speeches of God in 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, you see all of these attributes revealed to Job and thus to us. Uh, they're there to see. Paul, you remember in Romans 1, many years later, wrote that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. The surpassing power of God seen in his creation leaves every atheist blameworthy. Because nobody who's got eyes to see the world can think this came from nowhere. And if it didn't come from nowhere, it came from a very amazing source. And that's exactly where God started with Job, wasn't it? He reminded Job in 38.4, beginning. <clears throat> Job, you want to call me into a question? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? There's a rough edge to God's speech to Job, is there not? Don't think for a moment that God didn't love Job. He loved him. But he speaks bluntly with Job because Job has forgotten himself. And, uh, you know, it, they, in school, there were two kinds of kids. The kind of kid that always had to push the limits and get punished by the teacher. There was always at least one kid in every class, wasn't there? If you were that one, you don't have to tell me. But there's always one. And then you've got a rather room full of kids that are smart enough to learn from that guy's problem. They say, okay, I don't want to do that. That doesn't look like fun. I think, it, you know, to be very serious here, I think that the mistake of the great man Job in being too familiar with God is there to help me to keep my perspective. And the perspective is we're talking about the Creator. Psalm 148 speaks to the same point. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens and praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels and all his host, the sun and moon, praise him. All your stars of light, praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. The God who commanded the universe to be is the one that we're talking about. And these marvelous expressions in, in, in Job 38, for example, in verse 12, beginning, you have these wonderful word pictures, don't you? You know, it's a shame, isn't it, that so, to so many people, the book of Job is three chapters long. We, we've all seen that through the years. First two chapters and the last chapter. And then you've got a bunch of stuff in the middle that, that does not get noticed enough. But there are marvelous things in that. There's also some very hard things. But when God speaks, he describes his world in these terms. Have you ever commanded the morning at any time during your life? Do you know where the dawn lives? 
where it seizes the edge of the earth and shakes the wicked out of it. And like clay is molded by a signet ring, the earth's hills and valleys then stand out like the colors of a garment. And then from the wicked, their light is withheld and their upraised arm is broken. He describes the dawn, this gorgeous picture of, uh, it, it's like uh, you take uh, wet clay and you, you run a signet over it and it just makes those indentations. You guys <clears throat> have been up with the dawn and you've seen, maybe you've been out hunting somewhere and you've seen how that the earth just reveals itself in the dawn's light and it is just this gorgeous uh, carpet of indentations. Uh, the Lord said, you know what I do when I bring the light? I run all the meanness off because meanness likes to do its meanness at night. And I shake them out of their tree and get them home. And I make it safe more for people to walk around. And God says, you know, Job, do you do that or do I do that? Can you, Job, call out the clouds? The abundant water drenches you. Can you command the lightning so that it goes forth? Who has the wisdom to be able to count the clouds or empty the jars of water? You command the lightning, Joe? No, I do. I do. And he says in chapter 38, verse 22, have you entered into the storehouse of the snow? Have you seen where the hail is stored, which I have reserved for the tribulation to come, for the uh, day of battle and war? You know, you don't have to know much about history before you begin to learn about how weather has affected battles, key battles that affected wars, that affected millions of people for generations. You know, whole pages of history were turned because of weather, whether that's D-Day or whether that's uh, Napoleon retreating from Moscow or whether that's the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Uh, you know, the weather. And who controls that? That's the providence of God. I think it's a great story, the, the story of the war horse. That's one of the great pictures here that Joel is reminded of. Did you give the horses their strength and the flowing hair along their neck? Did you make them able to jump like grasshoppers or to frighten people with their snorting? Before horses are ridden into battle, they paw at the ground, proud of their strength, laughing at fear. They rush toward the fighting while the weapons of their riders rattle and flash in the sun. Unable to stand still, they gallop eagerly into battle when trumpets blast. Stirred by the distant smells and sounds of war, they snort in reply to the trumpet. You know, I was just um, in Central Tennessee, and if you didn't know, Shelbyville, Tennessee is one of the horse capitals of the world. That's where the Tennessee walking horse came from. Uh, you know, and they're proud of it. Man, I'm telling you, that the, everywhere you look, horses, horse barns, uh, horse equipment, they are magnificent animals. And when you think about a war horse, you know men have created a lot of different uh, machines to slaughter each other. But no man has ever been able to make anything that compares with a war horse. A horse is an amazing animal. Job, did you make the horse? No, God made the horse. Did you teach the hawk how to spread its wings and fly south? It's an old John Denver song I seem to remember from many years ago. I don't remember which one it is now, but he says something in, in one of those songs about how that he knew a fellow would be a poor man if he never saw an eagle fly. But I guess that's right. It is something to see, those big old raptor birds, they, they fly around. But it's not just the idea of, of their magnificence and their flying, but you notice here he said, I teach them to fly south. That suggests the migratory pattern of birds. That's a whole other uh, level of amazing to me. They tell me that there are some birds that will fly uh, on a regular basis, an annual basis, from northern Canada all the way down to the tip of South America. And I think, I can't go to town without a GPS. Now you tell me, how do you explain that? Oh, that's evolution. Yeah, right, yeah. Sorry. That didn't make good nonsense. God said, I taught them to do that. 
I gave them the wisdom to do that. Talking about birds, there are some magnificent birds, and then there's the ostrich, which is magnificent in its own way. Uh, and he talks here about how that, um, I, you know, she's, uh, she can uh, outrun the, the horse when she gets ready to go. You know why? Because I gave her that ability. But an ostrich is sort of stupid. Uh, got the brain about the size of a walnut, not a very bright creature. You know why? God said, because I made it that way. I gave it ability and I withheld ability. I'm the one that did that, Job. You didn't do that. I did that. And it's just amazing, is it not? We take our kids to the zoo and we show them all the animals. And, uh, and they are magnificent, each of them in their own way, aren't they? Think about all the variety. You know, all the different kind of critters that you find all the colors, all the designs, all the gifts, all the weaknesses, all of it. And you think, you know, what kind of artist could invent these creatures? What kind of engineer could make them? What kind of, of, of power can sustain them? Who is like the Lord? You know, God is not only all powerful, he is also ever present. I think I read this passage several times before it ever really hit me, the power of it. And that's Job 38 and verse 25. And there God says, Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness wherein there is no man, to satisfy the desolate and waste ground to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Did you catch what he said there? I'm sure you did, but I didn't for a long time. I just read this verse, and I said, yeah, God's in charge of the waters. But not just in charge of the waters. He said, I'm in charge of the water where there's no man. There are places on this earth that men are not, maybe never have been, maybe never will be. You know what God said about those places? I take care of them too. You know why? Because it's mine. We sometimes think about the earth and we think, well, the earth is made for man. And in a sense, that's true. I understand. But I read a passage like this and it reminds me of something. And that is that the earth might be made for man to dwell in, but the earth is not man's. The earth is God's. I'm going to make a statement here and then I'm going to explain it right quick and then I'm going to move on. Okay? I am an environmentalist. How about that? Now, I have to explain that. I'm not an environmentalist in the sense that the term is used so often today. There's a lot of nonsense, a lot of kookiness uh, that we find in our world today where people want to make a goddess out of the earth. Mother Earth has taken care of us all these years. Anything to just not give God the credit. I will save the earth. Can you imagine the arrogance of a man standing up and he's, I, I, my job is to save the earth. That's my, I mean, what exactly is your superpower? Oh, I use paper straws. Wow. I didn't know you were a hero. I'm not that kind. And I tell you, that's, there's a kookiness to some of that and a misguidedness. Uh, but, but what really gets to me, and this is not a political speech, I'm just talking about things that I think affect our spiritually. Here's a, from the NPR, National Public Radio site. And they had a story here a while back that said, study shows young people have a lot of anxiety around climate change. And when I read that, I thought, no kidding. They, they certainly would if they'd been listening to NPR because you try to scare people all the time. Here's a, another unrelated article. Four in ten young people fear having children due to climate change. And we've got a whole generation of folks, and we've been doing this for years, by the way, scared to death that the world's just ready to explode here. If we don't give the right people money uh, in the next 10 years, we've got 10 years. They always have 10 years. You know my advantage as an old guy? I've heard this all my life. And that's why it don't scare me anymore. 
I, I, that, that, those folks that are doing that kind of talking and talking in these hyperbole and this kind of ridiculous, outrageous speech, I've heard them all my life. Uh, here, here's a, a, an article. Uh, U.S. scientist sees a new ice age coming. The world could be as little as 50 to 60 years away from a disastrous new ice age. That was 1971, by the way. I haven't noticed anybody talking about an ice age lately. What are they talking about now? The world's burning up. Uh, Mr. Gore said in 2008 that the polar ice caps would melt completely in five years. That was 2008. Um, here's another fella uh, that is one of these same kind of doomsayers. This fella is not, these guys are not just somebody off the street. These are professors at Stanford, people at Dartmouth, people that go and talk before Congress and, uh, and, and affect public policy. This guy was being interviewed. He had been a critic, and he'd been a, one of these, um, again, climate doomsayers uh, for a number of years, and a guy caught up with him in New York City and asked him, do you still believe what you taught back then? Oh, yeah, I sure do. And he asked him, he said, uh, well, what do you think um, uh, what do you think will look different 20 years from now? By the way, uh, this uh, uh, particular interview took place in 1988. 20 years from now, how will things look different from where we're standing right now? He said, well, he said the West Side Highway will be underwater. Okay. That's the West Side Highway, by the way. It's also called the Joe DiMaggio Highway. It's fine. This was taken last year. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, I, all my life, I've heard these people who say, if you don't give me some money, the world's going to blow up in 10 years. This is the truth. And young people who don't have the perspective of being old, uh, and these guys wrap themselves in the mantle of science, and they are people who have, certainly are bright people, and they do a great deal of damage. You, Glacier National Park up there in Montana, I think it is, uh, for years had this uh, sign, goodbye to glaciers. Uh, why, if by the year 2020, all the glaciers will be gone. I had to take that sign down last year. Uh, sort of embarrassing to have that. Here's what I would say to our young people. Genesis 8, when God spoke to Noah after the flood, he told him, among other things, this, that while the earth remains... Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. I don't want our young people scared to death because of what they hear on the radio and television. Some of those folks who say those things may actually believe them. Some of them may be very cynical uh, money grabbers. I don't know. Lord judge that. I just don't want us to be caught up in hysteria. That's, that's the kind of environmentalism I'm not a bit sympathetic with. But let me tell you, there's another kind that looks at this world and recognizes its maker and says we ought to treat what God has given us with respect. There's a great old song, this is my father's world. And in my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. Every bit of it reminds us of God because it's his. You ever notice how many times in the scriptures that point is made? Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Or Deuteronomy 10 and verse 14. Heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord. The earth and all that is in it belongs to God. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 104? You, God, make the spring gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. What did God tell Job? He said, I take care of the world where there's not a man because it's mine. Besides them, the birds of the heaven dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. 
And you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly. Do you look at the forest and see the trees of the Lord? The cedars of Lebanon that he planted, in them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, and the rocks are a refuge for the rock badger. He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun to know it's time for setting. You make darkness, and it's night, when all the beasts of the forest creep about. Oh, Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And so I think the book of Job teaches us about God's omnipresence and about his possession, his ownership. God gives to man the right to use the earth, and we ought to use it with respect and gratitude. I used to use the illustration. I'd say it's sort of like renting. You know, if you rent a fellow's house, you don't have the right to go in and tear out the wall and just do whatever you want to do. You're just a renter. But I think that's probably not a great analogy. Because we're not even renters. We're guests. We don't pay rent on the earth. We just, we're just given the earth. And we ought to respect it. We ought to respect it for the simple reason that it belongs to God. He made it. Talking about God's making things and his, his omnipresence, his being where no man is. There's a great expression in, in 3841. And when starving young ravens cry out to me for food, do you satisfy their hunger? There are all kinds of animals out there that are far beyond the reach of man. And what he, God says to Job is, Job, I'm the one that hears their cry. Brother Peeler once made a point, Tommy Peeler, in my presence that, that stuck with me about this particular verse. He made a connection I had not made, and I'll share it with you if you give me a second. He said, the word here for cry, the ravens cry and I feed them. I think God used this particular illustration and word with purpose because earlier in Job's speeches, back in 19 and in verse 7, Job said, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. I cry aloud, but there is no judgment. Now, the word that Job used is the same word God used in 38. And I think the point that God was making with Job was this. He said, Job, you think you're crying out and I'm not hearing you? Let me tell you something. I hear the ravens cry. Similar to what the Lord said. He feeds the, the, the sparrows. A man named Edmund Morris wrote on this point and he made this particular statement. With God's detailed reminder uh, how he cares for his creation, especially the animals, there's a gentle rebuke to Job for thinking that God might have forgotten him. As the Lord Jesus said, ye are of more value than many sparrows. The central message of Job and to us is not an explanation of why the righteous suffer, but rather to call to sound belief in creation. Under God, we can trust him no matter what comes our way in this life, knowing that in the balances of eternity, the judge of all the earth will do right. And that's exactly so. That's the great lesson of Job. The ever-present God hears. God is also omniscient. We'll make this point quickly. In 38 verse 18, for example, God asked Job, have you considered the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all things. And where is the way that light dwells? And where is the place of darkness that thou mayest uh, bring everything to its own bounds and understand the paths of the house thereof? Job, you don't know about the light. You know, we still don't know about the light. At least when I was in school. When I took science in school and they tried to explain light, uh, 